Hi, this is Bill Cumby. I'm with First Church Ministries, um, teaching um, Sunday school class for uh, Ephesians, and we've moved online now. And we're going to be studying chapter three today. We talked in chapter one about the um, how God worked as Trinity, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, to secure our salvation. And Paul's prayer that we might understand that fully and access that power that's available to us in in Christ. Um, to solve our problems and also for us to draw closer to God and to lead others to him. And in chapter 2, we, we looked about um, that we were dead in our sins and that we've become alive now through Christ uh, and we walk in his way and that the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile has been broken down. Today, we're actually going to go a little bit deeper into that last section. Uh, we're, we'll be in chapter 3, but he actually talks a little bit more about the end of chapter 2, and also, um, again, the key verse that we're going to be studying here uh, at the very beginning. But let us, let's open in prayer, and then we'll look at it. Lord, we thank you for the time we have together. We thank you that you love us and care for us um, so much that you uh, pierced uh, time and space and came and lived a life, um, a sinless life as a sacrifice for us, and that you love us and care for us, and that you want to be with us through eternity. And so you've provided a way for that. And Lord, as we study your word and study your purpose for our, us and, and the church as a whole, Lord, I, I pray that it would cause us to love you more and draw closer to you. We ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. So um, the, the key verse that, that I keep on coming back to and that we will keep on coming back to is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. And um, in that verse, I'm going to read that. And, then in, uh, and by the way, just to let you know, uh, everything here is English Standard Version, okay? I read out of the NIV, an old NIV, not the, the newer NIV translation. So there'll be some slight discrepancies, but the, the, you'll get the flavor of the two of them um, together. And they, they don't, there's no contradictions. It, it really is a different of shading and flavor on these things. So, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, and he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. So this is the mystery of his will. So um, the word mystery is mentioned five or six times in Ephesians, so my, my memory uh, uh, clouds right now, but we'll see it in a second because I have it highlighted. Uh, and it, it's mentioned more there than any other book of the, of the New Testament, probably in the Bible, but certainly in the New Testament. And this mystery is something that was, that was hidden that's come out from hiding. It, it's something that you couldn't figure out on your own. Um, uh, the word apocalypse is from out, from out of hiding, okay? And we get the word revelation. We translate that as revelation in Scripture. Um, but mystery is something that, that you just couldn't figure it out. It, 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 and, and people love mysteries. People really want to find out what the mystery is. People want secret knowledge. They want to have no one in. Uh, as we uh, were solving the world's problem before we sat down to start the tape, uh, we were talking about the coronavirus and people's ideas and trying to figure out what's happening there. There's a mystery there that we're trying to do. Well. This, there was a mystery that Paul was talking about in Ephesians. And the mystery is this, um, that in the fullness of time, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. There is a unity now that, that comes through Christ. And we, we talk about that in uh, chapter 2. We looked at it this past uh, lesson. We talked about the fact that the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile has been broken down and why that was important. Um, it's hard for us to really, uh, the cognate experiences are there for certain groups of people and cultures where they've been so isolated, they've been out, they've been um, discarded. Uh, unfortunately, it's, that's what I can use by the rest of society, marginalized and, and there's no hope for them. And, and all of a sudden, they're fully accepted. And so that's what's happening here, because the Gentile is, is very interesting. The Jewish, um, uh, the population of, uh, of Jews in the Roman Empire was uh, probably 3 to 5 percent, is what people think. 
And most of them, of course, were probably in Israel, but there were some in the major cities and stuff. And yet the, the Jewish worldview was that um, there were Jews and there were Gentiles. And Jews were chosen by God, and Gentiles were not chosen by God. And, and not only marginalized as Carter, but, but there, were, there were actually rabbinic prayers that said, I'd rather be a dog than a Gentile, okay? You know, and, and, and so there, were, there was this real separation there. And most of the, most of the church members in Ephesus were Gentiles. And so uh, they were the marginalized ones. They were the outcast ones. And here we see that Christ is uniting all things. That is more than just Jew and Gentile, but it's not less than that. And so at the end of chapter 2, he talks about the fact that there is now one group. You know, there is no Jew or Gentile. It says at the, at the very end, he says, um, For through him we both have access by one spirit, that's verse 18 in chapter 2, and consequently we are, we, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on a foundation of apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. So Paul ends chapter 2 talking about they're, they're no longer being a dividing wall, they're all together, okay? And then he starts in chapter 3. So chapter 3, um, he says... It, 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 um, so I'm not a very good reader of scripture. I'm not a good reader of scripture. I'm not a good reader, period, because I tend to leap ahead and I tend not to look at the words that I'm supposed to be reading next. And so you'll get a lot of that. This actually happens with Paul, too. Not that I'm comparing myself with Paul, but it does happen when people get excited, is what I want to say. And Paul's getting excited here. He starts chapter 3. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And then there's this dash. The ESV has the dash. My NIV here that I'm using has a dash. Because he, he, when he talks about a, he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, he's referring to the fact that he's in prison now. So there's these prison epistles. We get uh, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And they're all written at about the same time period, and he's in prison, and he's talking about being a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And all of a sudden, he, he trips off. Surely, so he says, he says, surely you've heard about the administrations of God's grace. Um, uh, here here I'm, I'm going to go back into the ESV, so we're not, you're not saying, well, he's not reading the same thing. Assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, the, the section just before that. When you read this, you can perceive my insight to the mystery of Christ, which is not made known to the sons of man and other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirits. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promises of Christ Jesus through the gospel. So, so again, he's... he's, he's He's starting to talk about, he's, for this reason, I as a prisoner of Christ, and then he jumps off into this. By the way, he comes back to this in chapter 4. He picks back up, but he gets off. And chapter 3 is, sort of, is in excursus, and he wants to talk about this. Uh, of the gospel, I was made a minister through the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan for the, of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God may be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to his eternal purpose, which he realized in Christ our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. So he's saying, don't lose heart, I'm in prison. Let's, let's look a little, we're going to take a step back here. Uh, I did a word analysis of, of Ephesians, and, uh, and I want to talk to you about that, because it's important to see what the key themes are there. And then we want to pull this passage apart in two parts, the first part and the second part that you see here. So what I did here, I want you to understand how important Christ is in here. So 
mentions of Christ, there are 168 references to Christ. Either it says Christ or him or his or some reference to Christ. There's about 5.5% of all the words in Ephesians are Christ. I did it in red uh, just to show you. I'm sure you can read it all, but no. I, I actually reduced the text down and did a word search and a search and replace to highlight these things. Okay, so you'll see that here, um, that, that Christ is all the way through here. Uh, in fact, the, the section here where it's a little light, he's talking about the armor of God, talking about prayer at the very end here. Um, he's, uh, at this first part here where Christ is a little light, he's talking about the church and how the church should respond as, in a godly way. This is all about how we should live. This is all about walking in Christ. And so we have here the Trinity. We have here the prayer that we recognize the power of Christ. Here that we're talking about um, how we used to, um, the, the life, uh, I'm sorry, the life we used to walk in and now walk in. And in here, it's talking about the mystery. So these, these passages here, let me actually go to this next one. So I, I, back, I, I highlighted them in yellow so they don't stand out as much and added mystery of walk in here. So there's actually the mystery, that, that text that we just studied, the first text, is mystery here. And this is the passage we're studying today. It's in blue, I, I put it in blue. The word mystery is mentioned uh, four other times. And then there's a mystery here when he's talking about the um, mystery of Christ in the church as uh, in husband and wife. And we'll come to that at the end, chapter 5. In chapter 6, he's talking about that he's an apostle of the mystery. But this is talking about the mystery. That's why I want to sort of show you what's going on here. The one other thing I really wanted to emphasize here uh, is the word walk. And the walk is sort of the lifestyle we have. So he talks about us, uh, we used to walk in death and now we walk with God here. Here he's going to talk about to walk in a manner worthy. Here he's going to talk about th these passages here are talking about how we walk in Christ, in, in a new life in Christ. And so those are, those are key passages in, in uh, this, this section, um, I'm sorry, in, in this book. And in this section, mystery is the key thing. And so, uh, again, here I put down the key verse that I pulled from the front that, that we just already read. And this is the first section uh, that we're going to be looking at today. And then this is the second section. So we have uh, the mystery is, four, is repeated four times in here. So again, Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. And again, um, when he gets to the word Gentiles, it, it just triggers off all this stuff. So he says, um, assuming you've heard of the stewardship of grace that was given to me for you, how this mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. So he, and he, he wants to develop this idea of this mystery a little bit more. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, you have to, you have to sort of put on your, um, your time cap on this thing, okay? Because we have, we're so immersed in the gospel and, and Christianity that is spread through the Western world and most of the world, but certainly permeated a lot of, uh, of the thinking and institutions and philosophy of the Western world, governments and, and everything. Um, and we talk about separation of church and state, and we don't even realize how deeply Christian values are rooted in anything the government does, okay? Uh, uh, the value of individual life. Um, the, the responsibility to be fair and honest and just. Um, uh, again, other religions have similar moral codes, but not the same moral codes. The Judeo-Christian moral code does have um, flavors in it and, and, and parts in it that just are not apparent in others. And so we, we get this, um, this mystery. Uh, we have to go back to the time of Christ when the Romans were ruling. Uh, and, and again, there was a good legal code there, and, and, and the Roman legal code, if the Romans were known for anything, it was building good roads and uh, their legal code and their soldiery. And so uh, their, the legal code was very good, um, but um, no one could have seen that the Jews and Gentiles would be united, okay? If you look back and you were a Jewish person, you thought, um, there are people that are going to come to know God, becoming Jews, and the world might, there might be 
a lot of God fears in the world, but when they would say a lot, they would say that would be a percentage of the Jewish population, which again was 5%. So if they had 10% of the world that was fearing God, that'd be something. And to do that, they needed to become, again, Jews, okay? And the Gentiles are like, uh, there's many competing standards of truth. There's a lot out there. And, 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 um, and it, w it was not, um, as, as we know by now by Revelation, um, there was truth in other faiths, but it wasn't the truth. And the f truth that the, the Jewish people held was also ensconced and encumbered by uh, a lot of ceremonial laws that set to set them apart, to keep them separate, uh, and God's intent was to keep them separate so that he could develop them as a people coherent to worship him. And now, Paul's saying there is no Jew and Gentile. They're all together. How can that be? I mean, who, who would have thought that? I mean, certainly none of the prophets seem to think that. Even in, the, even in the prophetic revelation, he says here, it was kept hidden from men and other generations. Even the prophetic revelations where the whole world is serving God, it's the Jews that are there with God and people coming in to serve the Jews with God. Okay, it's not, it's, there's still a Jewish group. There's still God's people and nations streaming in to serve them, okay? So there's no concept of there being one salvation for mankind. There is not one salvation for mankind. If you're Jew, then, then your salvation is bound up in being a Jewish person who loves and honors God and that God's gonna take those other nations and, and bring them in, but they're not gonna become Jewish. They're just gonna come in and serve God and the Jews of the chosen race. And if you're a Gentile, you don't have any concept of, of that kind of kingdom at all. Um, and so the mystery was hidden and now it's been revealed. And this is the mystery. Um, the mystery that is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. So, so this is not my idea. This is not my opinion. This is what the verse is saying. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, okay? In other words, they become the godly people just as the Jewish people are the godly people. There are, is no separation. In fact, I was, I was talking with a friend yesterday who's, who's Jewish. I was saying that we, I was going to be teaching today, and one of the things I te was teaching is that God loves all people, that his salvation is for all people, not just a group of people, Christian, uh, well, uh, not for a group of people. I didn't say Christian or Jews or whatever. I, but, I, but I said, for all people, you know that concept was bought very easily by, to, by this person because our society now says that we are all one group, okay? There, 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 are, there is these, I, people don't like other people and stuff like that, but the general societal tone is that we're all in this together. In fact, in fact, with this coronavirus going on, there's this talk about uh, being apart while we're, uh, being apart together, okay? The idea that, that even though we're separated, we have to still maintain our connections with each other. Um, that just was not the concept that was in there. And so, so Paul goes on and says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to God's and the gift of God's grace was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all saints, his grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to life for everyone is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God may now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Now, um, Again, if you go back to that time period, and, and it, it, this is hard to recreate, um, it's hard, and a lot of it is supposition, and so um, this may or may not be true, I'm just letting you know, but, but he, if the devil was trying to figure out, and the demons are trying to figure out what's going on on earth, and again, he's referring to these, these rulers and authorities, he's referring to spiritual beings out here, not necessarily good or bad, but there are, there's a spiritual hierarchy he's looking in here too, trying to figure things out. And it, it, there was never this idea of one. It would, it would have been this, you know, because that's what, that's what Scripture was teaching. It was God's people and there was the rest of the world. That's what Scripture was teaching. And so, 
There was nothing in there that's talking about the whole world becoming Jewish. And, and so if you are a demon, if you're a demon, you're planning and stuff like that, you're thinking, yeah, well, I might lose 5, 10, 20 percent of the, to, to people who become Jewish in age, but certainly the whole world is never going to all become Jewish, okay? So the, the whole world is, is going to be led astray. And if you're the whole world, um, you may have grasp on truth, but you don't have the absolute truth. You don't know the gospel of Christ, the, the gospel that God came to us, not that we, it's not about living a good life, it's about God living a good life through us and God sacrificing himself for us. And so, so the heavenly beings are probably looking on and thinking, yeah, there's a redemption going on here, but it's a pretty minimal sideline redemption here. It's not the whole world. And, and there is an intimation, again, of the whole world serving God in Isaiah and some other, uh, other prophetical passages, but it doesn't really seem like the whole world are believers in that sense. They're, they're serving God, but children of God? No, that, that really doesn't come through. And so Paul's talking about here that there's a mystery that's been revealed now. No one could have imagined this. We just take that for granted now, quite frankly. We, you know, uh, in some ways, um, our faith is too easy. And, you know, we say, um, you pray the prayer and you become a believer. That's not true, by the way. You have to have belief. There has to be a true change in your life to be a believer. Praying a prayer doesn't do anything more than open a door does. So uh, if you open a door, you've got to step through it. Okay, so, so the prayer is just, if, if it's sincere and you're doing something, that, that will make you, you can become a believer. But... Um, We've made it so easy that it's sort of like, well, yeah, sure, anybody can come to God. And, uh, and we just assume that. And, we, and because we assume that, we also assume that everybody is with God, that God's, God loves us all, God cares for us all. Um, and those two things are true, but that does not mean that there won't come a time when we may or may not be separated from God because God is angry with our sins. And, and at the end, we decide. Uh, so, so we are predestined. And we have free will. And our free will makes a choice. And, and our free will says, I want to be with God or I don't want to be with God. And we say, well, certainly when people see the alternative, they'll say, I want to be with God. That's not what we see. That's not the truth. Because when you say you want to be with God, it's sort of like, it's sort of like a parent in the household. And my kids are always welcome to come home. They're adults, you know, when they're adults, always welcome to come home. But they live by my rules when they're in my house. And that's, that's, that's how, and that's with God, too. So there are a lot of people who say, oh, I, I, I'll accept God. I love God. And then God says, well, okay, then you, this is how you need to live. And I ain't going to do that. I, no, no. And, and, and Scripture is very clear. To love God is to obey God. So, so uh, you know, if, if you disobey God, you're in rebellion, and you're not loving God. So... So there's this, this tension here, but what Paul's saying in this is that everyone has access to God. All of us can be true children of God. We're children of God in the sense we were created by God, but, but there's also the, the child of God that loves the, the, the parent, that cares for the parent, that wants to be one with the parent, that wants to be part of the family, and that is what Paul's talking about here. So he goes on and he says, this was according to the eternal purpose which he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through your faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. He comes back to it, the fact that he's a prisoner uh, again, and he's suffering. Now he's in prison. Um, so that's the end of this passage. I, I want to come back to um, this whole idea, though, of um, the gospel is open to all, freely given, uh, freely extended. Um, the mystery that we've seen now is that, that we as Gentiles, and most of us are Gentiles, we're born Gentiles, um, uh, i.e. not Jewish, um, have full rights into the kingdom of God. But we don't have those rights unless we come to God. Okay, so... We talked about the chapter 2 at, at the beginning. He says, you used, to, you used to be dead in the sins you walked in. So 
because we have access, because God has given us full access, does not mean that we have entered into that kingdom. Um, to enter into that kingdom is to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Christ is the head of all things. All knees will bow before Christ one day. Not all knees will willingly bow before Christ. It's like, it's like if there's a war going on and you defeat an enemy, certainly in the, in the olden days, they would, uh, they would either bow before the, the conqueror or they'd give them their sword or some kind of submission. So some people will bow their knee to Christ, not as their Lord and Savior, but as their conquering king. Um, that they're not affiliated with. And, and um, the harshness of that is hell, okay? And hell, people say, you know, heaven is going to be a really boring place. I'd rather be in hell. You hear expressions, I'd, uh, I'd, rather, um, I'd rather party in hell than be in heaven. You know, I'd rather party in hell with my friends than be in heaven. There is no partying in hell. Um, hell is stripped of all the good things, okay? All the good things are gifts from God, and those are stripped. And what you have is yourself. And you think, well, I'll share. My, my friends, we're buddies, we're good. No, the experiences you've had, and most everyone has had an experience where they thought they had a buddy, a good friend who betrayed them, that's going to be the turn of events in hell because everyone is looking out for their own. And, and they, there is no, the, the fact of you caring for another person, that's a gift of God too. You know, you, the, those are gifts. The gifts, the, the love that we have for one another, that's a gift from God. And so hell is a horrible place, but it does exist, okay? There's this thing that says, well, everyone is a child of God. We are all created in the image of God. We are all created to be a community and a unity. But because of our rebellion, our initial rebellion in Adam and our subsequent rebellion by every single person, um, we have now created two sets of mankind. We've created mankind under Christ, the head of all things, and we've in the old man, Adam, and, and, and those that are rebellious. And one day those that, that sit under the old head who do not accept Christ as their Lord and Savior will be separated from God forever. And Paul teaches this clearly, and he pleads, and the reason he's here and the reason he's writing this is because he's pleading with us to come to God to be, to realize this, not to rise up in rebellion and saying, I can do it myself, or here we're all, uh, we're all going to be united under Christ. One day God will forgive us all our sins. You know, um, no, that's not taught in Scripture anywhere. It's taught in Scripture that those who call on the name of the Lord, those who call on him to become, the, to become his, the Lord and King and Savior of them, he grants eternal life to. But the others, there's an eternal damnation. So I... There's not many times to really speak of that in this, pa in this section, but I'd be remiss not to say that, that universalism is not a, a key teaching of Christianity. We don't all come to God in the end. We're not all wandering in the end. And God often sends very hard times, difficult times in our lives and in societies. Um, sometimes he sends them, sometimes he lets them happen, but they happen and they cause, and the causes for us to turn towards God, okay? Closing on this, I got an, another minute. Um, nature is broken, and so we get horrible things happening in nature. We get hurricanes and tornadoes, we get droughts, uh, we get plagues, and and now we're we have this coronavirus thing uh, that is sweeping through the world now. Um, I don't know what its causes. I don't know. I have not God's mind in this at all. But I will say this. I know that God longs for us to turn to him and beg him and pray to him that he would turn his hand, that he would heal supernaturally. Um, and I, God works in ways we don't understand, but we do know that he will work in this situation. He, will, he is powerful, he will work, and he will answer our prayers. And so I, I guess as I close this section, in this time period, what we're facing now, I would say we need to be one together, united, turning towards God and asking him to turn this plague from us, to turn this virus from us, that we, we would trust that he would watch over his people, but we ask him to watch over the whole world, that we ask him to heal the whole world, that we ask the whole world to turn towards him and beg him for his mercy during this time, um, because it is abundant. 
and he has promised to hear our cries. Uh, let me close in prayer. Lord, I ask that you would uh, help us to love and honor you. Lord, as, as we face this difficult time and, and um, um, we, just, we ask that we might reach out to others around us in love, and sharing your love with them, and your concern for them, your desire for them to not only survive but to, to, to do well during this time. And Lord, we pray you turn your hand uh, from this plague, uh, that, well, that you turn this plague from us and that you would uh, heal our nation, that you would give our doctors wisdom and how to treat and how to prevent, but also that you would supernaturally intervene too. Uh, Lord, help us love and honor you and give you glory for you're the one that truly loves us most and cares for us. We pray in your name, Jesus.